Good morning, everybody. Um, Paul, thank you for being here with us. So this is probably going to seem pretty basic, but what is 5G and why should we care? You know, Mikhail, everybody thinks 5G is about speed, right? Everybody here thinks 5G is speed, right? It has nothing to do with speed. It's all about money. Really, it's all about money, quite frankly. Yeah? So let's have a think about this. In the 4G era, 3 and 2G era, the cost for the telecom companies is increasing. The operating cost increases. 5G is cheaper than 4G. Mm -hmm. All right? Not of the capital cost, but of the overall perspective, yes? And just now you heard from Clay talking about things like in the enterprises, you know, transforming the world. If we look at 5G very specifically in health, let's take a day in the future. You can have virtual consultations. You can have holographic solutions, all based on 5G. You can't do this in 4G. Mm -hmm. But everybody in the world thinks 5G is about you know, smartphone, smartphone, smartphone. You're not going to download Spider-Man in three seconds. You don't care about that. You're streaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, speed is a, a part of the overall picture here, though, sure. right? And so what kind of speeds are we talking about? What's possible today? So let's give some examples. I know, you know we're Huawei is a hot topic in the US. But we're delivering about 650 megabits to rural US, rural economies in the US, using 4G. Mm -hmm. So now, where's 5G going to take us? 5G, 1 to 3 gigabits per second. Very, very easy to achieve using 5G technology. But again, it's not about the speed. A telecom operator, China Mobile, China Telecom, China Ecom, they can't monetize all this speed you know, to make a, a user happier or get more money from a user to make more money. Mm -hmm. So to monetize speed for what we call consumers is very difficult, unless you move into gaming or holographs and things like this. But the real money, the real transformation for society, and that's what 5G is about, is really moving into the enterprise or the B2B business mm -hmm. in manufacturing or health, for example. OK, so give a few more examples. You mentioned manufacturing, health. Um, some of the, the use cases there are obvious. What are some of the not so obvious use cases that you're starting to see or could see down the road in the next couple of years or so? Sure. So let's take one that has uh, very little money attached to it at all. And that's called. I thought it was all about money. It's all about. So let me explain how, Mikhail. Right? Uh -huh. so, it's, it's the, the money not directly, yes? Let's talk about connected ambulances. Mm -hmm. So in the UK, they have a, a concept of connected ambulance. And I'm sure here in China as well as Guangdong or, or Beijing or Shenzhen, it doesn't really matter. But you know, ambulances being connected with the high technology equipment inside mm -hmm. need low latency and they need high speed. Mm -hmm. They save lives if we can do this. Now, saving lives directly doesn't have a lot of money. But to the politicians, to the people, there's a flow on effect, which is why it's always about money. But the challenge is that today, the government says, I want 4 or 5G to 95% of the people. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I'm in the UK, I can't travel on the M1 without a call dropping. If I'm in Australia, a call drop. If I'm in the US, a call drop. Let alone have a, an ambulance with high technology built inside it, connected by 5G. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the telecom operators will have challenges. But what I see here in China is that we are deploying 5G technology on the lampposts. The lampposts are where the cars are, where the people are. So in China, we think differently. We think about execution. We think about where's the business benefit to society. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of other countries, you know, they're trying to say, who's first the race to move forward? I was with Korea Telecom's senior vice president uh, on the weekend in the World Economic Forum in Dubai. And he gave a very good example of how to save lives for people who are lost. Mm -hmm. And you have here very good examples in China where within you know, half, a, half an hour, you can identify people because of all the cameras. But the cameras are only where they can see. So what they've done in Korea is they're launching dirigibles, like airships. Mm -hmm. And they're using 5G control these so that they can see. Yes? Here in China, we're using drones with 40 megabits to be able to come back to be able to find the criminals mm -hmm. with speakers. So these things change lives. These things improve society. They improve security. Um, but you're not saying that China doesn't care about being first, are you? Because you mentioned in other countries it's about the race and that here it's about what's better for business and what's better for the people. Yeah. Um, you know, We just saw an announcement that 5G rollout here in China is actually ahead of schedule. There's a reason why these announcements are put out there. So of course, what of do course. you make of, of so, the race? Mikhail, look, it's 
Of course, that's a marketing message, whether it's a marketing message between two companies or three companies, or whether it's between one or two or three countries, yes? Mm -hmm. Everybody would like to claim they are first, they are first, they are first. But let's think about the real benefit. I mean, you can say you're first, and then everybody's going to be saying, but why can't I use it? Or you said I have a first in, in health. Look, we have a great example between Beijing Hospital and, and, and one of the provinces with remote medical, you know, robotic-based over 5G surgery. Uh -huh. That's a first, but that's one. How do we scale that across the whole industry so that rural provinces have access to these sorts of things? So you can be first, but do you have the business model? Do you have the ability to execute? And the difference, quite frankly, is if you look at the incentives, the way they're driven. Here in China, I can still remember in 2014, six countries in, U in Europe spent 18 billion euro on 4G licenses. Mm -hmm. At the end of 2014, only 60,000 4G base stations, 60,000. Here in China, just one telecom operator, a couple of hundred million dollars equivalent for the license, 720,000 base stations 4G at the same period. Mm -hmm. So you see the incentive policies are quite different. Now you come to 5G. UK 1.4 billion pounds, Italy 5.6 billion euro, I'm not sure how much in America, but here in China, spectrum, 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 mm -hmm. incentivize, you know, try to get these things moving. It's more about delivery than saying I'm first and then suddenly finding you have nothing to do. Uh huh. Okay. Well, you uh, you basically live on an airplane. You spend your time going around to a lot of countries. We're all very aware of the situation with Huawei in the U.S. Your your motherland, Australia, is not all that much more welcoming to to you either. But but talk about um, what you're seeing in other countries because there are, the world is big, obviously, and you guys sure. operate in many different regions. Um, who is other than where we sit today? Um, who is really what regions of the world are really pushing this aggressively, and what are you seeing about different strategies and how they're rolling out? Okay, sure. So first of all, here in China, if I'm not mistaken, as of last week, we have about 45,000 mm -hmm. yeah, 5G base stations just here in Guangdong, if not probably just in Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. We have at least 10 million people who have pre-registered for 5G. Let's put that in perspective. In South Korea, you have KT, which has a million and 50. Okay, just to put the numbers, so who's going to move forward and backwards and things like this in terms of this race, you say, for consumers? Mm -hmm. In the UK, all four operators, so the United Kingdom, all four operators have announced strategies where they've already deployed in between 10 and 15 cities throughout the UK. Mm -hmm. Now you have countries like Germany. Okay, Germany's become very different with a company like Siemens getting Spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're doing that is because, you know, Siemens is a big a big manufacturing corporation. I think everybody knows the company. Very reputable, very very clever, very innovative. But they can see that if they deploy 5G in the factory, mm -hmm. they save about 1% productivity. That's about $100 billion, hmm. right? So the opportunity can be with people, for consumers. You talked about speed. Mm -hmm. The opportunity can be for low latency in hospitals and in medical. The opportunity can be in many connections connecting all these robots. Here in China with Huawei, we're experimenting with other manufacturers. You know, this room today, now we have a lot of people, maybe 200 people here. But in six hours, there's nobody. But tonight, we can bring in half a dozen robots, mm -hmm. connect them to 5G here in this room, connect it to an AI platform in a cloud, mm -hmm. and then the robots will self-organize themselves to make a bottle, mm -hmm. or maybe a glass tomorrow, yes? So we can change the nature of manufacturing because manufacturing for the last 150 years has been very linear. You know, you do a job, you pass it to Paul back in the old days, right? That's, mm -hmm. That was linear-based uh, manufacturing. Today, robot A does a job even in a car factory, passes it to robot B, passes it to robot C. But you imagine if these are all self-organizing, it completely transforms manufacturing. So you, you have an example also in Norway, speaking of yes. older industries that are being disrupted and, and, and revolutionized. Can you talk about that? So in Norway, we have a concept called um, the, uh, the facial recognition of the fish. Yeah? And uh, in Norway, they have these big fjords. So Norway does two things. The first one, they have um, a lot of oil, oil and gas, as you know. They make hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars in oil and gas. But their second biggest um, industry 
is smoked fish. Is fish, right? Salmon very specifically. Uh -huh. So if you go along the Norwegian coastline of about 5,000 kilometers, you see rows and rows, just like this um, of this stage, of circular fish tanks mm -hmm. in the fjord. Now all these fish tanks are connected by fiber mm -hmm. to a ship, which is connected by fiber to the land. The fiber breaks, the maintenance cost is high, they need a lot of people to manage the ship, and they're monitoring the fish, they're feeding the fish remotely, they're analyzing the pollution and the water, the temperature and all the pollutants, they're analyzing all the, the, the fish feed. Mm -hmm. Now when we do 5G, we're bringing 5G in from the coastline directly to this fish farm. Uh -huh. So we save money because we don't need people. We have higher quality of cameras, which is why we can recognize the parasites on the fish. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're gonna be recognizing the fish themselves because it's increasing productivity. Increasing okay. productivity lowers the cost, you make more money. So you're not kidding, it's, it really it's is facial real. recognition it's for salmon. Absolutely. Wow. We save 20% okay. on, um, on the feeding of the fish. Uh -huh about four to five percent on uh, stock improvement uh, through recognition of lice and other things. And then we save about $150 million on, uh, on manpower savings. Wow, okay. Um, I, I wanna go back to talking about, you know, you say I'm calling it a race. I think everybody calls it a race at this point. Um, but it, they're clearly, China has uh, the, the first mover, first maneuverer advantage here. Um, what do you see going forward? Um, I think we're all aware of the where things stand in the U.S. and the issues with Spectrum and, of course, with suppliers. Yes. Um, but do you see that first mover advantage sticking over the next few years, or is it something that could look different a few years out? What would it take for it to look different? Oh, that's that's a very challenging question, but. You see, the stimulus, the need, China's understood a couple of things that I've seen since I've been living here and working in Huawei for the last 11 years or so. They've, they understand that to move forward, you need to leverage technology. Mm -hmm. So which technologies? Artificial intelligence, IoT, and specifically through Huawei 5G, yes? So the Chinese government understands that these technologies are intrinsic to economic growth and industrial development. They understand it. Mm -hmm. They understand it so much that they incentivize. You know, it's, it's a bit like how did Huawei, how did Alibaba and Tencent and others move forward? Just go and do it, we'll see, you know, how it works. So they encourage these things. In the West, we have a regulator, right? What I see is we have regulation. But in China, I see enablement and innovation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very different. So how to make, you're saying, others catch up, or what would it take? I travel around the world, I meet most of the presidents, prime ministers, ministers, regulators, everybody, all the countries, yeah, kings and queens. Uh -huh. And this is my explanation and suggestion to them. Change regulatory policy to enable investment, to enable innovation, and you will transform your economy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what's required. Here in China, 45,000 5G sites in one city. Mm -hmm. In one city, by the end of this year, it'll be three or four hundred thousand sites just within China. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world will be similar. Most of that is actually in Europe and in Middle East. Mm -hmm. Why the Middle East? Because the governments, the administrations there understand they can't survive on oil forever and they have real requirements and they want to transform. Mm -hmm. Minister of Dubai, I was on stage with him in, 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 um, in the World Economic Forum in Dubai. If you listen to his vision and what he wants to fix, understanding technology, including things like AI, not forgetting security, not forgetting privacy, but to have mature discussions about privacy and security, rather than scaremongering and saying, oh, we can't trust this, we can't do that. Collaboration is far better than trying to isolate. Um, I know you have been asked about this repeatedly. You just went and did a bunch of interviews in the States, and um, clearly it's been a very hot topic. Uh, but this, this um, offer or, or dialogue, suggestion, whatever you want to call it, of licensing 5G technology mm. to U.S. companies, how real is that and what could it look like? Okay, so if we were to take at its basic, the basic premise, which is um, Western countries, and mm -hmm. it's led by one administration, I'm not going to say one administration is right or wrong, that's not my job, but if we say that that's the first premise, that there is a, a fear, 
Mm -hmm. So Huawei's made an offer which is very simple. If you really fear it, we'll license it to you, you can pull it apart, you can fix what you want, mm -hmm. and you can develop. You can compete with Huawei, you can OEM, you can do what you like. Mm -hmm. That's a fair offer, yes? People say it's an unusual offer, you know, nobody's ever done this. Well, in 2003, Huawei did it with Motorola. Mm -hmm. Between 2003 and 2008, we licensed our 3G technology to Motorola. A Western company, Huawei, the same thing for a technology. There's nothing special about it. It's, you know, it's an OEM arrangement, but it's an offer that Mr. Ren has put out there to say, if you really believe that there's no competition in the world or you'd like an American champion or you'd like to use your own version of this, please, we're, we're open. And this is an example. If you listen to Mr. Ren, he's very forward thinking. He's very pragmatic in, in what he, what he talks about, you know, don't take too much market share. You must be part of an industry supply chain, mm -hmm. right? We must buy from the US, US must buy from China. That's fair, that's called global trade. Mm -hmm. So if you want these sorts of things to move progressively forward, then we need to think more laterally about solutions and we need dialogue, Mikhail. I agreed. Uh, a lot of people though have, have called it more of a call my bluff kind of offer. Mm. Uh, what, what likelihood would you give this actually happening? I don't speculate on the future, right? I'm a technologist by heart, sorry, and try to be a bit of a businessman entrepreneur. Um, no idea. Okay. No idea, sorry. Okay, fair enough. Um, another question for you, you, you mentioned uh, rural areas in the US specifically, obviously uh, that's something that's of interest and of concern across the world. And so as cities and ur urban areas are increasingly becoming, uh, you know, more connected yes. and getting 5G, what does that do to the digital divide that exists in so much of the world and how are you addressing yeah. that? So that's a very good question. The reason it's a good question, it was one of the hot topics in the World Economic Forum in, um, in Dubai on the weekend. And there is the fear that, um, you know, the gap gets, gets bigger, mm -hmm. that the rich get even richer and, you know, through these sorts of technological advancements, whether it's 5G, AI or, um, or cloud or, or IoT. So to put things back in perspective, remember I said 5G is cheaper than 4G, yes? Mm -hmm. So what we do know is that 5G is like a big bucket, okay? Like a big bucket of water. But it's a bucket that holds more than its equivalent 4G. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to invest in this infrastructure, for a similar price, you get more. So you get more bang for your buck. More bang for your buck means I can get more customers, which means I'm incentivized to actually deploy, because remember, the telecom companies are commercial entities. Mm -hmm. But the government needs some sort of stimulus to try to get them to, to deploy these in the rural areas. Uh -huh. So any common infrastructure is of value to the rural economies. But when I was in the US, the most interesting comment I got back from the, the Midwest um, companies, the reason they love Huawei, the operating cost is zero. The product doesn't fail. Mm -hmm. So that means their operating cost is even lower. And the biggest cost for a telecom company is operations. It's called OPEX, OPEX, OPEX. But coming back to the capacity of 5G, it has the ability to give more to more people for a similar number. Mm -hmm. What we've never spoken about is that 5G can reduce the carbon footprint. Everybody talks about speed. But we know if we continue to deploy 4G across the world, you will double the carbon footprint of the mobile networks. And if we use 5G, you reduce that. Huh. So these things you know, are all interrelated, right? But 5G in rural has very good application. Well, we uh, unfortunately need to wrap it up, but we look forward to having you back and hearing uh, more updates a year out, hopefully. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Michael. I'll see you back over there. I'll see you.